So good morning, everybody. I wanted to tell you that we've disabled the chat function uh, till the very end uh, so that we then, are, well, at least keep your questions and then put them on at that point. So I'd like to start this morning with a prayer. Lord, we come together in this wondrous mutuality of your love for each of us and for each other in this parish community whose very name is that of your mother, Mary. Today, we come to honor and learn about Mary who mothered and taught you as you grew into adulthood. She is the epitome of courage, strength, and faith. So may you grace us with these qualities as we continue to support each other in this difficult time. You are indeed the source of our hope. For all this, we pray in your name. Amen. So I have the privilege this morning of introducing our speakers, uh, whom many of you know well because they are belong to us. So let me start with Reverend Kate Sonderegger, who has taught since 2002 at Virginia Theological Seminary, where she holds a chair in systematic theology. The Doctrine of the Holy Trinity, volume two of her multi-volume systemic theology was published by Fortress Press just last month. A priest associate at St. Mary's, Kate writes and lectures extensively, was a member of the exegetical planning committee exploring the letter of First Peter for the next Lambeth conference and currently serves on the theology committee for the House of Bishops. Peggy, who's real, I guess given name is Margaret, I never think of her as Margaret, Adams Parker has taught since 1991 as VTS adjunct instructor. instructor. She writes and lectures widely about the visual arts and the Christian life. An artist who often deals with religious and so social justice themes she has completed commissions for churches and religious institutions across the country, including Mary as Prophet for VTS. She created the woodcut Stations of the Cross and the Mary sculpture for St. Mary's, where she has been a parishioner for over 30 years. Kate and Peggy co-authored Praying the Stations of the Cross, Finding Hope in a Weary Lord, which features Peggy's woodcut, woodcuts and meditations drawn from Kate's sermon. So Kate and Peggy, we turn this all to, over to you. And as I mentioned earlier, others, please mute yourselves. And we have disabled the chat function to the end so that you know that. Thank you too. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> Joan, thank you for that beautiful prayer and the gracious introduction and for this invitation. Um, this is this is a subject dear to my heart. And so and it's always wonderful to um, to present together with Kate um, and a special thanks to Jay and Luanic and Elizabeth Brewington, who led uh, me and Kate, but me in particular through a dry run yesterday. And um, it was really invaluable. And thank Elizabeth for the stunning um, annunciation that she, the an announcement of, for this, um, for this lecture that she put up um, on the, the e-blast. So thank you both, Jay and Elizabeth. We will make this PowerPoint available for download um, as a PDF. So if you want to use, look at these images um, in, in greater, um, spend more time reflecting on these images, you can. And I've added to that uh, PDF some questions at the end for people who might be unfamiliar with using um, images in this way. And I also want to call your attention um, to St. Mary's All Parish 
online exhibition of image and word, um, which we're planning for Lent, um, taking to heart the words from Isaiah, comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. And we invite all of you in the parish to reflect on this season of anxiety and loss. Perhaps you might write or make an image about how you've experienced loss or where you have discerned God's presence, in what places you have found comfort and hope. And we really mean all parish. We would love for everyone of any age to take part. Not many parishioners are working artists, but you could send us a picture shot with your phone, a prayer shawl you knitted or a prayer you wrote for an elderly relative, words about the joy you find in working at St. Santa Maria, or maybe the comfort in spending time over a favorite recipe, perhaps even a meditation on one of the images from this morning's talk. We look forward to gathering these into a Lenten meditation. So our sister Kate will read as our opening prayer a poem by 20th century American poet Anne Porter that holds together the honor and the titles that the church has accorded Mary through the centuries, together with the reality of Mary's life as the wife of Joseph the carpenter in a country under Roman occupation. And the two images that we're gonna put on the screen, so we can do this, um, embody those understandings. Welcome friends. This is a poem by the American poet Ann Porter, and the title of the poem is Cause of Our Joy. We will use this as a meditation and opening time for contemplation. Rock crystal, clearer than crystal, stronger than rock. Snow crown of Sinai, melting on the heights, pouring through the valleys in pure rushing water, and wine that sings of justice. Chosen from the chosen, mystical rose, your creature petals mirror that beauty no one can see and live. You hide in your heart like dew, simple and silent, that blazing majesty. Small as you are, your fragrance fills all the world. Fragrance of hope, fragrance of the gospels. Come to the old woman whose lodging is the street. Come to the drugged boy, the landlord, the general. Come to the hunted hunter by his jungle river. Come to the banker, the prisoner, the torturer. The hungry, the shut-in, the runaway in danger. Come to the backward child. Whether or not we know you, Come to rich and poor, come to us all. Star of the morning, there is such darkness. Only by the light of your innocent fire, we know this is the morning. But sweet in this dark morning is a freshness of new bread. And the newborn word in his cradle is just beginning to stir. Queen of angels, you're up early, washing, baking, sweeping. Young country girl from a scorned province. Broken for the broken. Wife of a carpenter. Mother of a convict cause of our joy. 
young country girl from a scorned province, a moving description of the humble Mary we encounter in the infancy narratives, a young Jewish girl bold enough to question the angelic messenger, how can this be? Joan Turkus describes Mary as a gutsy Jewish woman, but then obedient in response to overwhelming and no doubt terrifying news. A young woman pregnant before her marriage who gives birth in a humble setting and receives a group of lowly shepherds who honor her newborn son, who has the resources to offer only the most meager of sacrifices, a pair of doves or two young pigeons when she presents her newborn son in the temple, who flees state-sanctioned persecution, becoming a refugee to save the life of her son. I'm going to lead us through some images that depict that humble Mary, and then Kate will look at images of Mary, the exalted one. We'll begin with the Annunciation. <clears throat> we often hear about Mary's yes to God. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. But recall that Mary's first response to the angel's greeting is a question. How can this be? Think what is summarized in those words. Confusion, perhaps fear, uncertainty. Tanner, the artist here, seems to embody these emotions in this remarkable painting. The angel, a beam of light. Mary, as far back as she can reach, in the corner of this careful depiction of a Palestinian interior. Her shoulders tensed, hands clasped, head lowered with just her eyes raised. This is not the way that we greet great good news. The expression on her face is hard to read, perhaps a mixture of awe and uncertainty, but she is not undone by terror. Rather, we see her poise and her courage. Jacob Epstein intensifies this response because this is a two-dimensional work. It focuses on the figure alone, a Mary who is young but worn with peasant features, her shoulders tensed, wringing her hands. We sense here the weight of what is asked to ma of Mary to bear the son of the living God. And we recall the Lord's words to Moses in Exodus, no one can look on me and live. And Patty Whitman brings the narrative into our own day with a middle-class white American teenager in her bedroom. And in Mary's, the contemporary setting brings home to us the stakes for a pregnant teenager. And in Mary's time, the stakes were much higher. Joseph could have had her stoned. That is why we call him the just man. Matthew tells us that Joseph, being a just man, was minded to put her away privately. This reality may set the scene for what comes next in the Lucan narrative. And Mary went with haste to her cousin Elizabeth to the one person who would comfort her. Some artists have depicted the visitation as a scene of great beauty, befitting the beauty and holiness of this encounter, as in this exquisite Della Robbia with a young and beautiful Mary and an elderly Elizabeth kneeling before her in adoration. Other artists emphasize their humble origin. Kata Kolbitz shows us two working class women, their encounter luminous with that most tender of gestures, Elizabeth's hand on Mary's womb. And Romare Bearden understands them as African-American women offering strength and comfort to one another, their hands clasped in a barren landscape. All of these show us the visitation as a tender moment between two women. A different interpretation 
which occurs in hymn texts, but I believe is unique in the visual arts, is Mary as prophet. Remember that the Magnificat, Mary's hymn, begins as a song of praise. My soul magnifies the Lord, but then it shifts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones, lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. It seems to me that these words place Mary in the line of the Old Testament prophets, <clears throat> voices that call us to account. <clears throat> In this sculpture, I have depicted Mary as an African girl <coughs> with the cropped hair of a very young girl, her shoulders, hands, and whole body tensed, <coughs> inwardly focused on the prophecy that consumes her. <coughs> Excuse me. And Elizabeth reaches out to comfort and protect Mary in that moment of vulnerability. <clears throat> Let's look then at some nativity images. This is Emil Nolde's painting of very Jewish Mary lifting up her newborn, the birth blood still on her hands, her face lit with pride and joy. Rembrandt shows that tenderness and holiness come not only among the beautiful, but among the humble, the light shining in the darkness, the Christ child like the white hot center of a flame that lights all of the faces. In our own sculpture of Mary, this is a cast at the Episcopal Church of St. Mary the Virgin in San Francisco with her body protecting and surrounding this child, even <clears throat> as she is vulnerable through this infant. We recall Simeon's prophecy, <coughs> and a sword will pierce your soul also. <coughs> and finally, we see Mary as refugee. <coughs> the Japanese printmaker Sadeo Watanabe emphasizes the urgency of their flight with the wind bending the trees and Joseph glancing back to check on the safety of mother and child. And contemporary American artist Tanya Butler <coughs> links this flight from persecution with the plight of Jews in Russia fleeing persecution as their shtetl burns behind them. What does this Mary have to do with honors and titles? How can we re reconcile these images with the image of Mary embodied in those titles we heard in Ann Porter, mystical rose, queen of angels, cause of our joy. Friends, you can see why of parishes uh, throughout the country want to hear Peggy Parker describe art and its significance for our religious and spiritual life. It's um, always such a, a treat and a privilege to hear her and to work with her. Uh, what I want to do is pick up on this thread that Peggy has started for us about the complex way in which Mary has entered into our Christian life and tradition. Uh, she is not only the humble one, but the one exalted. And these images that I'm going to talk about briefly lay out and depict in powerful ways the uh, spiritual exaltation of Mary. There is a tradition in medieval theology that is uh, often <clears throat> termed maximalism, that the uh, maximum grace and beauty and honor 
that can be extended to a human being should be applied to Mary. And the reason for this is not only that she is described as one full of grace, gracia plena, as we are going to see in the Van Eyck depiction, but also because as we see in this slide, she is theotokos, a Greek term meaning the <coughs> bearer of God. It is this phrase, theotokos, that joins together Christology and our understanding of Mary. Everything about the exalted Mary is tied to who Christ himself is, the enfleshed God. And because the deity and humanity of Christ cannot be separated, but are joined in what the tradition calls a personal union, Mary gives birth not simply to a human baby, though she does this, but she gives birth also, and in virtue of this, to the Son of God. Now the Theotokos has a particular place in scripture. Father Andrew mentioned this morning the way in which John the Baptist sums up everything about the Old Testament prophecy. Um, he is the greatest <clears throat> in the kingdom, um, yet the least in the kingdom of God will be greater than he. Mary holds this position, but in a particular way, a matchless way, that she sums up Israel's scripture in her own person. In this remarkable icon before us, we see that consummative dimension of Mary's role as the bearer of God. Here she is as the burning bush. She is um, in her own life, that bush that drew Moses aside from his tending of the flock. Uh, she is illumined by the fire of this bush, the fiery presence of God, yet she is not consumed. This is an icon in St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai, <clears throat> and if we were to see the full image, we would see Moses in the corner, uh, um, bending down and removing the sandal from his foot, a, a part of that image is there on the screen for us to see. So here is a way in which the central vision of Israel's scripture, uh, that God will name himself and be present to Moses and commission him, is summed up in Mary and in her holding the <clears throat> realization of the promises to Israel. These themes are depicted in this remarkable painting by Jan van Eyck, a masterwork that we are privileged to hold in the National Gallery in Washington. And um, when in God's good time, we are able to visit the galleries again, uh, this is a painting uh, worth every moment of study. Van Eyck here places Mary in the midst of a, a basilica, a, a cathedral. She is now the uh, exalted figure who is full of grace. 
she's portrayed here in the traditional Marian color in blue. The uh, room in which she sits is filled with symbols of uh, Mary's position as the summary of all the hopes of humankind and most particularly of the chosen people. <clears throat> the angel splendid in his robe and in his uh, fiery wings uh, comes before Mary. And you can see that Van Eyck, in addition to many of the details in the painting, has included the central words that speak of Mary as the one who is filled with grace. The um, detail that Peggy has placed within this slide shows the Ave Grazia Plena, uh, Hail uh, Thou Full of Grace. And in a, a wonderful detail, uh, as the dove um, comes down on a stream of light from the heavenly realms. It, um, it receives Mary's own response um, now um, placed upside down so that the spirit can receive and <clears throat> read it. Uh, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, Eche and Celia Domini. The, of course, in uh, medieval Latin, all of the long words are abbreviated to help the uh, poor artists and scribes. So Domini is given in those three brief words. Notice, too, um, in the midst of all of this rich symbolism, Van Eyck has included tiles um, engraved uh, baked tiles on the floor, and two of them in our uh, detail here show the way in which Mary exemplifies in her exaltation the uh, Old Testament promises to Israel. In the first tile, uh, we see uh, David executing Goliath. Um, he has been felled with the five uh, smooth stones, and David is cutting off the head of the um, threat to Israel. And above that is Samson in the midst of his agony, pulling down the pillars where he has been um, chained and um, bringing down the house of the oppressor. So here we see <clears throat> the theme of redemption and liberation from oppression being brought up into the story of Mary. This is why she is cause of our joy. Another medieval image that uh, reflects these uh, protective and redemptive tones is this um, wonderful medieval, late medieval sculpture by Mikhail Erhardt, uh, the Virgin of Mercy. Uh, this is a tradition in which Mary shelters within her all <laughs> sorts and conditions. We can see them crowded up under her robe and she with a, a calm authority encircles them in her own perfect majesty. Now in the medieval period uh, and actually continuing in the Marian apparitions over the centuries, Mary has been an advocate for those who are 
on the outskirts of society. It's not surprising that she appears to shepherds or to uh, the poor. Um, she is uh, often seen as someone who is the last protection for fugitives, for outlaws. Um, she has a, 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 a dangerous power in her sweeping all of us under her care. And here we see a modern depiction of this same theme. A, a younger Mary uh, welcoming under this a lovely brocaded robe, the members of this particular Lutheran congregation uh, under the Schutz mantle, the protecting cloak of the Madonna. Uh, this painting by uh, contemporary artist Melissa Weinman shows <coughs> the way in which individual portraits. Um, particular people find themselves drawn to the one who bears the Son of God and who is exalted in her innocence and grace. Now, Mary, because she is standing at this midpoint between uh, the Old Testament and the New has both elements within her in this exalted tradition. Both the prophecies as we saw with Samson and David, but also the end times. Uh, Mary in her person is the past and the future. And here we can see in this very rich uh, etching by uh, Albert Durer, the um, woman of the apocalypse who is traditionally associated with Mary. Uh, here she is crowned with the sun. She bears on her headdress the very stars of heaven. And God the Father is blessing her as she appears with healing in her wings. She stands above the heavens on the moon. She is the Baristella, the queen of the stars. And she is the one who will bruise the heel of the serpent as predicted in Genesis and fulfilled now in this apocalyptic vision. Uh, the um, many-headed dragon um, appears um, threatening in the corner, um, but it cannot touch her uh, because she <laughs> will be triumphant over this last danger, this last apocalyptic threat to the good creatures of God. And finally, I, we wanted to show the uh, image that belongs to the Americas that ties up all of these themes of exaltation and of scriptural fulfillment and prophecy. This is the image in the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, and here we see a Mary for the first time looking like the indigenous population of the Americas. Uh, she is robed as the queen of heaven. She stands upon the moon. She is enshrined in her whole person with this <clears throat> ray of light, the fire of God's own presence within her. So she belongs to the ages 
to Israel, to the end times, but also to us, and particularly to the poor uh, for whom she is special advocate and protector. Thank you, Kate. Um, I wanted to end with some images that like Ann Porter's poem, hold together these ways of seeing Mary and show her as an example to us in our lives as Christians, which echoing Father Marrow's sermon this morning, how each of us ordinary people may be guided and inspired by Mary and her example. This Madonna Angola <clears throat> was based on um, UN reports by the daughter of a friend who was working in Angola with internally displaced people. And Mary's courage and dignity in the face of appalling circumstances. These people in Angola were gathered in these huge metal sheds. It's very moving and I think can serve as a real example to us. Roy de Carava's photos, this one of a Mississippi freedom marcher, shows a kind of prophetic courage, a young woman who dares to face the dogs and fire hoses and hatred to bear witness to the rights of all people. This kind of courage in this same cause is still vital to us today. This is an image of Harriet Tubman, Moses of her people. We've all seen, or I have seen photos of Harriet Tubman in a cloak. So it, it occurred to me that I might depict her as a virgin of mercy sheltering under her cloak a family of escaping slaves. And we can pray that each of us might serve in this same way. Some of you may have been to our Mary's Day services and we often use this image of the Annunciation um, as part of that service. And in this in this image, the Holy Spirit, which Kate mentioned that in the Van Eyck, the Holy Spirit comes down on the ray of light and often it's a, it's a little tiny beam of gold. Um, and here I Im imagine the Holy Spirit literally descending through her and consuming her. And I think we might think of this as an example as we pray to be guided in our own lives, to be um, filled with that, with the Holy Spirit in the way that Mary is. And finally, this quite astonishing painting of a young, a beautiful young woman taken up in the beauty and holiness of what she's singing, radiant with the Holy Spirit she might be singing those words. My soul magnifies the Lord. That sense of joy and hope that is so important to us right now. I want to open us up for questions in just a minute, but first I want to end our session with a prayer that Kate wrote for a service and an artist talk at the time when the sculpture of Mary as prophet was dedicated at Virginia Seminary. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, born of Mary, the God bearer, open our ears to hear her prophecy and strengthen our arms to serve your people. Open our lips to proclaim your liberty to captives. Open our hearts to rejoice in your coming justice. This day, O Lord, feed 
the hungry, scatter the proud, unseat the mighty from their thrones. This day we pray, may your kingdom come, O Lord. Amen. So I think Joan or Jay are going to um, allow you now to, to write in questions or raise your hands, maybe. I don't know. And we are happy to, um, uh, yeah, yes, let's go. To take your questions, responses. Let's see here. We can go down there. So the chat is now open, but I, I really am, I, words fail me. I, I am in awe of all that you have presented. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I will, I said, I opened it at the beginning and some of you may not have heard that, um, that um, this PowerPoint is going to be made available as a PDF and it, at the very end, it will have um, questions to guide you in looking if, if reflecting through images is not something that you, um, you've done before. So we've uh, put on the screen share here the PowerPoint slides. So if people would like to see particular ones and ask questions or talk about them, we can call them up readily. Yes. <clears throat> Is there anyone you'd like to talk about in particular? I, I just, I think um, your work is so remarkable, Peggy. I just, oh. I'm, uh, I am struck by how it, it, it combines both the humility and the exaltation. Uh, and it's, uh, it's rare to find images that do both, that, that have the capacity to hold within them uh, this way in which Mary is the summary of scripture and of the hope of final deliverance and judgment and humility. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this uh, uh, scripture can be read in so many ways uh, and to allow the spiritual depth to be captured in a single complex image that that's a, a wonderful. So there, there are several questions coming in on the chat. Um, Sarah Gregg asked, was it during the Reformation that congregations moved away from veneration of Mary? It, it, there was a, um, a reaction by uh, Luther and Calvin, the magisterial reformers uh, to say, um, that some of the devotion to Mary uh, properly belonged to Christ uh, and that Mary should be allowed to be uh, the humble um, uh, a Galilean uh, young woman who gives birth to this incarnate son. Um, Neither uh, Calvin nor Luther actually uh, disavowed the Marian titles. That is, they didn't uh, disagree that Mary was mother of God, um, because this is an important part of teaching about Christ himself. Um, but they thought that the veneration and particularly the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, which was um, a part of some medieval teaching. Uh, they thought that distracted from the centrality of Christ. So in the years after the Reformation, um, <clears throat> the uh, Roman Catholic Church continued to elaborate this theme of exaltation, whereas Protestant churches tended to diminish the role of Mary. So when when Peggy talks about a a, um, <laughs> a a Protestant devotion to Mary, this this is um, 
this is a recognition that those of us who have been raised, I, well, I was a, raised a Presbyterian, are not exposed to this uh, rich tradition of exaltation. And so we discover these fresh pathways into Marian devotion. Great. Um, Susan Ligon has a very good question as well uh, about the Durer piece. Uh, she asked, Mother Kate mentioned the association of Mary with an apocalyptic vision. Could you elaborate on that? <clears throat> um, yes, this is um, Durer had a, a particular interest in the book of Revelation and um, did uh, a number of remarkable uh, engravings of uh, Revelation. Um, and this is, this is one of the scenes within it. Um, the, it the, um, the Marian dimension here is you know, picking up on this theme that there are, are two women it, in the book of Revelation, um, the, um, the woman who represents Babylon. And she is um, the, um, the, the woman who is um, uh, the emblem of oppression and of commerce and of exploitation. And then there is the woman who is the queen the, the uh, one clothed with the sun. And it, um, the church has seen in that woman, uh, Mary as uh, the exalted one who is queen in heaven and who uh, fulfills in her person the, the hope of all of us for deliverance from Babylon. Um, the seven-headed dragon and the great empires because <laughs> she bears the son of the living God. Can you see why everyone wants to sit at Kate's feet? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would add that Durer was a great admirer of Luther and when they thought Luther had, been, had died or been when he was hiding for two years, two years, um, uh, he said, oh, what will we do now that we don't have Luther to guide us? But he remained a, a faithful, observant Catholic. And these extraordinary images uh, in this series from the uh, apocalypse and the Mary, images of Mary. And so it's, um, it, it shows that our, that our, um, image of what happened in the Reformation that, that just swept all this away and that you had to be one or the other is really pretty um, uh, a caricature. Mm -hmm. There's another question from uh, Gregory. Uh, could you comment on the Renaissance practice of purchasing Madonna and child paintings as ways to pray for fertility? Mm -hmm. Oh, what an interesting question, Gregory. Um, that uh, there is um, a, a long tradition of using um, images either from pilgrimage or that that um, uh, pick up elements of the um, veneration accorded to relics um, to use those in the midst of one's own private sorrows and trials. So the idea that, that using an, an image of Mary would be a, um, a guide to praying for uh, fertility, for childbirth, uh, goes back not only to the Annunciation to Mary, but to the long series of women who call upon the Lord because they are barren. And it, um, we remember uh, Sarah and, and Hannah, um, Rachel and Leah, that uh, at times when they, they so long for uh, 
a child, for a son. Uh, they call upon the Lord who delivers them. And Mary uh, sums up in her person all of that longing. And I, I think this is one reason these images were used so widely for um, intercession in times of calamity, such as infertility. And certainly it was true that um, many of the prints that we have, if you go to the National Gallery, Prince of, Department of Prints and Drawings, and they will pull out for you the Dürer or Rembrandts. Or, but in the medieval period, there were inexpensive woodcuts that you could buy at a shrine and you would take it home and um, it was really kind of, well, anyway, you would take it home, you could paste it on your wall, people would put them in their strong boxes to protect their, that was kind of magic, you know, to protect their money. Um, and um, there was a, that power that, that was invested in the relic, as Kate says, was then partaken of by this, this, this woodcut and the woodcut is a very simple, it's just, it's, it's the most simple and direct and inexpensive and easily reproducible kind of image. So if, if Gregory went to Italy um, and, and he couldn't afford um, the painting, he could then buy one of these, one of these prints. Um, Right. There's, there's another great uh, observation from Rebecca Roper. She says, uh, lovely discussion. My understanding is that Mary had a full and long life passing away in Ephesus. Could you speak to that belief and the extent to which Mary is presented in art as an older woman? Mm -hmm. that, uh, it's a wonderful question and I have some thoughts about that, but uh, do you want to speak about that first. Well, I would just speak about Mary as an older woman. There are very few images. There's that wonderful Bellini where, where and we don't have these images, so we can't pull them up, but mm. there are a very few images of Mary as an older woman. And I think that the classic example of Mary when she should be older as very young is Michelangelo's first Pietà, the one in the Vatican, where Mary is young and beautiful. And, um, and he, in fact, Michelangelo said, should she not be virginal, the one who, who bore the mother of our Lord? So he had a, a reason for this. Um, and an artist continually depict her um, as, as young, even when she's sorrowing over the body of her, of her son. I've never seen a picture of her in old age in Ephesus. So, but I'll, over to you, Kate. Well, we might think of the tradition of the Dormition of the Virgin. Oh. Um, this was <clears throat> a, um, an a ancient Marian title um, and widely used um, uh, among Anglicans um, and Catholics until the 19th century when the uh, bodily assumption of the Virgin was made Catholic dogma. Um, the Dormition was um, the one place I can think of where the artistic tradition reflected on Mary's long life. Uh, and we see a, a just a, uh, a hint of this in the book of Acts where Mary is explicitly included among the apostles in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And in the, uh, the um, typos of the Dormition, the apostles are gathered around the bed uh, as Mary is dying and they are expressing their grief. And there she often is shown as a, a dying woman. We've got uh, one last comment uh, from Sarah Gregg. Um, actually, we have several other comments. So this is <laughs> a lot of people are trying to <clears throat> But um, Sarah mentions, isn't it true that those of the Roman Catholic faith view Mary as a 
intercessor for them with God. Uh, we believe we don't need an intercessor, someone to speak for us to God, but we can still believe Mary is a saint for the role she was chosen to play. Uh, good, that's a, a wonderful um, summary of the theological debates about Mary and her significance in our religious life. Um, uh, one way to think about um, devotion to Mary or, or to saints, the, the Anglican uh, tradition is filled with commemoration of saints, um, is that uh, they don't um, mediate between God and ourselves, um, but they might pray for us the way um, I will offer prayers for all of you when I give thanks for the parish of St. Mary um, and the way in which my friends will pray for me. This is a kind of intercession that is not mediation. And as Cranmer says and has us say in the um, Book of Common Prayer, uh, we have one mediator, um, Jesus Christ, the advocate. So, uh, so this is um, a way in which we can combine notions of intercession um, and uh, Christ's soul mediation. Uh, we're coming up at the end of the hour. Um, is, are there are any other pressing questions. Um, if not, I'm going to turn it back to Joan Turkis and definitely appreciate everyone's uh, interaction in, during today's session. Well, I, I don't even know how to express my gratitude to both of you and to really thank all of you who have joined us. And I'm hoping you will take on Peggy's project for us, each of us, that we will respond in some creative way as that we can share. Is it at Lent, you're thinking? It's during Lent, and there, there, the instructions for this are on, um, are in the messenger, the announcement messenger, and then, and Becca Wistie, we Becca, there's Becca, is, is, she and I are the co, there she is. Okay. She, we are she. We are the co-curators of this. So, Becca, do you want to say something about it? Just again to invite everyone, no matter what age you are, and remember that it just doesn't have to be just painting and sculpture. Any crafting that you've done, knitting or embroidery, anything is welcome as long as it's creative. We look forward to seeing it. I'm excited. Yeah. Mm. Now, thank you both for doing this. And I was thinking that. This has been so rich that I'm sure all of us will have many thoughts <laughs> in, over the coming days. So jot them down as a meditation or whatever works for each of you. So thank you again, the two of you in particular, Peggy and Kate, and for all of you who joined us. Thank you. It was, it was a real privilege. Mm -hmm. What a gift. Yeah. We will, we'll hope you'll come back. <laughs> we were here for the long haul. That's right. Thank you. We all are too. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you.